Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I am maybe sort of a new man. I woke up on Saturday of Memorial Day weekend started my morning routine, and then I had this this realization, which was, I don't need to put out a podcast every single day, especially during a holiday weekend. I already had two episodes in the can. This isn't like I was going in with nothing to, to post for you guys, and I had another two scheduled uh, Saturday afternoon. But I thought, what if I just give myself a break, not post anything, not check download stats, not be the virtual memories guy for a little while. And it felt great. I mean, as much as I I got into that rhythm of making the daily episodes for two months, two months, um, I was glad to just give myself a little time away. And I don't think anybody missed it. So, you know, I, I think we all came out all right. Now, I did wind up spending that time on another creative project that... um Occupied the heck out of me, but it's something I promised you guys for a long ass time, and I nearly wrapped it by Monday evening. That's right. The secret project that I would always tease at the end of episodes in the before time when I would be asking you guys for Patreon support, it's just about ready. Um, it is a 32 page zine of my writing, photography, and podcast excerpts, and it's called Haiku for Business Travelers. Uh, I've referred to it in the past occasionally with embarrassment. I'm still embarrassed now, but it's just about done. I have a little work left on it, um, but it's laid out provisionally. I got a quote from a local printer. Um, so this thing's actually going to happen uh, as long as I, I just dot the I's and, uh, you know, cross the T's, et cetera, I guess. Anyway, I will send it free to all of my Patreon supporters and other donors first, uh, and then to past guests, supporters of the show, et cetera. Um, there is no digital version of this. There's no online component of it. It's just going to be this print thing, and that's that's what it's there for. I'm I'm just really happy that it's that it's finally something. Um, that took so long, I don't want to jinx myself, but I'd like to make this a, a semi-annual occurrence. We'll see. Anyway, it is amazing what a break from the routine can do for you, is what I'm saying. I just, knowing I didn't have the the regular rhythm and the, the, the just the pressure I'd put upon myself to do the show every day, just really, really uh, freed me up. So we'll see going forward if I stick with six days a week or, you know, rejigger things, maybe take weekends fully off again so I can, you know, kind of do other stuff. Anyway, let's get to the show. Uh, my guest this time is the writer, performer, director, and producer, Kathy Koja. Kathy and I recorded uh, almost five years ago when she was a guest at Worldcon. We went up, well, I went up to Saratoga uh, to sit down with her and uh, meet up with some other science fiction and fantasy writing pals. And at the time, uh, I was plotting over her amazing novel, Under the Poppy, and had just started the cipher, uh, her, her best known book, and was intrigued by the immersive theater events she makes. Now, uh, 2020, she's got a brand new short story collection out from Meerkat Press called Velocities. The writing's fantastic. The stories are evocative and, and strange. 
And one of Kathy's central themes, um, what the making of art does to us, both as artist and as audience, I guess, it works itself out across a, a whole bunch of forms and genres. It's not the only subject she writes about, and some of the, the stories are just... <sighs> They're just weird, weird and, and sort of horror, but not not horror, horror. Um, she She's in a genre of her own, which we talk about and which is characteristic of other people who, who write about her, her work. Uh, Velocities is an unsettling book, and I mean that in a good way, especially during this moment in our, our history. Now, since Kathy lives in Detroit and wasn't planning an East Coast tour for the book, even before the pandemic hit, we'd already talked about doing a, a remote session somehow. So I figured let's do more than a COVID check-in with her and, and record a full-length episode instead. I will admit that some of the uh, COVID check-in daily podcasts have been creeping longer and longer and longer lately, um, but I promise I'm going to get those under control again. Now, as caveats go, uh, not a ton, just her not having the same audio set up I do, the mic she was using is a little harsher than, than this one, but whatever. Uh, also, I am embarrassed to note here that Kathy and I did not spend too much time actually talking about velocities during this episode, but trust me, the stories are really good. I'm never great with talking with fiction writers about their fiction in conversation. It's just... You know, it, it can always be a little weird. Nonfiction writers, it, it's easier. But uh, but Velocities really is a wonderful collection. Uh, again, it's from Meerkat Press. So um, go pick that up. Now, here's Kathy's bio from the, the flap copy for Velocities. Kathy Koja writes novels and short fiction and creates and produces immersive fiction performances, both solo and with a rotating ensemble of artists. Her work crosses and combines genres, and her books have won awards and been translated and optioned for film and performance. She is based in Detroit and thinks globally. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Kathy Koja. Virtual Book Tour? Is it your first time doing this without having any physical presence of a, a book it, tour for it Velocities? It is. It is. And we could kind of see that coming on the horizon uh, as, you know, I had a super cool event planned. It was um, a live event called Fireflies, and it was going to encapsulate uh, not only the book, but there was going to be a movement artist and live video and live musical improv. And it was going to be pretty sweet, I have to say. But on a grander scale, the privations that many people have to put up with, if all I had to do was take my book to the internet, it's not a problem. That's been my constant refrain through all those daily podcasts I've been doing. If this is the, the big change I have to accommodate... I'm getting off pretty goddamn easy. I know, all right? Considered. So, having read Velocities, I have no idea how I would describe the stories as a collective thing. I saw your one minute pitch for it, but you don't have a a any category that you've ever felt you fall into as a writer. Not yeah. really, no. And someone had pointed out to me, which was great, and I also saw it reflected in a couple of the reviews that. The book itself is kind of in the Kathy Koja genre, yeah. and that's sort of what it is. So I feel if it if it works on that level, if people can approach it as because there are stories in there that are historical fiction, there are stories in there that are you know kind of futuristic. There are a couple straight up horror stories. There are a couple straight up who knows what kind of stories. So if it's an introduction to my voice that would please me most and I would hope that would help readers decide whether or not they wanted to read it or, you know, go further into my, my backlist. Yeah. I don't think we talked about it when we met that time in Saratoga. Yes. Was it Saratoga? It was. Yeah. Um, do you have like form formational or, or foundational texts? Were there books that, you know, you look back at and say that this is what I read where I realized, you know, this is a direction I needed to go in. 
Well, I was already going in this direction from probably five years old. And as soon as I realized you could have stories that you could read them and then you could actually make them yourself, I was off to the races. Um, probably the Ur text for me as a young reader, and it's probably the only text from all those years that I can continue to go back to with pleasure and profit is Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights, I had no idea it was as structurally clever and sly and smart as it is. You can just read it and go, this is crazy pants. Most of these people don't get out of this book alive. Everybody just says exactly what they feel like saying at any particular time. And it's complete this raw emotion, which is why, I mean, shoot me, but it's why I could never get into Jane Austen because I know everyone's going to get out of Jane Austen just fine. They might lose and a the, couple bucks, right? But they're going to be all right. Yeah. And it's about manners. Manners then, dictating language and and the the, the, the parameters or, or, you know, the way it, it compels us, I guess. And money, too. I mean, it's very, yeah. very structured on – it's on that side of the fence. And I don't have a lot to do with that side of the fence. So I could never really understand those books. But when I grew as a writer and as a reader, I could look at Wuthering Heights and say, this is – is amazing because when I first realized, I don't know how many reads it took me or how old I was, but when I first realized that the narrator of that book was being refracted through another voice who may or may not have been telling the truth, it's like, mind blown. <laughs> it's like, you can do that. Oh my God. And it's a straight up, I think people, people look at it without maybe there are so many, many lenses you can see that book through and you can straight up see it as a pure Gothic ghost story. Everybody in the book takes ghosts for granted. You know, it's like, oh yeah, I saw Heathcliff and a woman ghost walking around up there. Oh yeah, don't go that way. <laughs> Nobody's like, are you fucking crazy? They're all like, oh yeah, yeah, leave that alone. And it's just beautifully singular. There is no other book like it. There is, I mean, tragically, she died so young and without being able to share any more creations. But my God, if that's what you did with your life, uh, yeah, you you did great. <laughs> you you yeah, rung do, the bell. Do you, do you go back to it? Uh, do you go back to read it relatively often? Or is oh, it every other every other enough? year, probably. No, probably every other yeah. year. I did a, a live immersive immersive event based on Wuthering Heights called the Heights, and I asked people to reflect on the the things that you should do and the things that are like the right thing to do. And the Nellie character rep kind of represents what is the right thing to do. And Heathcliff and Kathy are like the thing to do. And I asked people to give their own answer to that question after the performance was over. And I left out a bowl of finger paint, people painted on the walls. And some of the things people said were just hair raising. It was like this incredibly pithy graffiti. It killed me to have to paint over the gallery walls when this was over. It's like, oh my God, they did such a great job. But yeah, I think you can go back. I think that's the, the hallmark of art is that you can go back again and again and again, and it will always give you something. Did you ever come across readers who tell you that about your work? I know you've got a lot of Cypher fans out there in particular. Are there, there are people who use you as a touchstone? And did it weird you out to discover that? It did not weird me out. I was very joyful because if my work can do in a, in any way what books have done for me, I'll be super grateful. Um, I really believe more and more strongly as I've been doing this for a long time now. And writing is, if it's not a conversation, it's really nothing. It's not, look at me, I'm riding my unicycle made of words, you know, check me out. It is a conversation. It's going to be different with every reader. It's going to be different every time. And if people, especially right now, if people can entrust to me their attention and something I'm doing can give them that conversation that they can have that back and forth with my work, oh, that there's nothing better. Awesome. Speaking of this present moment, you're in the Detroit area, right? Yes. 
I'm in northern New Jersey, which is the number two hot zone in general. Where I live is is pretty mild as as pandemic situations go. But how are you dealing? What's the what's the vibe? And how's your coping mechanism for it all? Well, I have to say that I'm extremely proud of the governor's response. Gretchen Whitmer, I think, has done an amazing job at holding the line and keeping everyone safe in the state, whether or not they agree with her politically, whether or not they believe in science. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, it is saddening on the one hand to see the behavior of which is really not a huge segment of the, of the population. And it's saddening to see that behavior kind of become the national face of this state. But then I look at Gretchen Whitmer and I'm okay. Yeah. And locally, the vibe, you know, people taking responsibility or do you have a lot of, <sighs> ah, I'm just going to walk around maskless, you know, I'm you know, young. I, well, I'm, and I'm sure there's, to be honest, I am super, I work at home anyway, so that aspect mm -hmm. of my life has not really changed. And I am pretty cautious. Um, the places that I'm going, the the post office and, you know, the local Trader Joe's, I see everybody masked up. And there might Good. be, you know, one or two outliers uh, in Trader Joe's last week, there was a woman with her mask pulled down under her chin, yelling enthusiastically about corn to somebody on the phone. She's like, I'm getting that corn you want. So I like, okay, I, I, whatever, just move away. But in general, I'm yeah. seeing decent compliance in the very small circles that I'm moving in. And the question I've asked a couple of fantasy, horror, science fiction writers specifically has anything in your reading background prepared you for what a pandemic would turn out to be in reality? Not for a minute. Yeah. The Not boredom factor is one of those things that nobody ever really thought of. They, yeah, you just sit around and watch Netflix all the time. And you know, it's, it's, and that's the reason I started watching Cuomo do his pressers every day. Uh, my son lives in Queens mm -hmm. and at that point, Queens was the most impacted borough in the most impacted city in the most impacted state in the most impacted country. So my anxiety levels were off the charts. And I started watching Cuomo and became addicted to this, you know, moment in your day that was filled with facts that were delivered to you without spin. It's like, here are the things that are happening here. Here is, you know, what we're trying to do about it. And watching the pandemic through that lens reminded me very much of being in the ICU. I have never been in there myself. I've had to sit with family members or deal with family members who were in that situation. And it was exactly like that. That's what prepared me. It's moments of absolute terror and moments of mind numbing boredom where you're waiting you're just waiting yeah. for something to happen. And then the terror comes, but then something better happens. You know, so <laughs> that was the best. And nothing that I have, have written or created uh, comes close to that, I don't yeah. think. Yeah. I, I, Scott Edelman had the, you know, I thought some of my zombie fiction might repair me, but then again, none of us ever wrote about people who wanted to volunteer and go out and get bitten. That was yeah, right. you know, there's, there's still this <laughs> yeah, this whole thing. We thought we we thought of everything, but you know, we still didn't account for that. So, um, did you find it difficult to get in? Well, did you have a transition period? I guess and my thing was that I couldn't really read for the first month. I just couldn't focus. Focus. Did you find yourself having difficulty either reading, writing, or or I know there was the uncertainty around you know the projects you were working on. Um, did you find it difficult to, to quote unquote, be productive? Uh, yes time? and no. Um, part of, part of it is the timelessness and having that rug pulled out from under you. It's like, oh, I had these meetings and things that I was going to schedule and wow, that none of those things are going to happen. So you're disoriented a little bit for a minute, but the hardest part, and it is continually a problem, is not checking the news all yeah. the fucking time, constantly right. looking to see. Because on a, on a completely inhuman level, this is fascinating. 
to live through times like this with this, you know, murderous government and this pandemic. And now in Michigan, too, we've experienced these unbelievable floods. Oh, yeah. Jesus. I wasn't even thinking about that. But yeah, and to live through this time as an observer is a car wreck fascinating. You, It's hard to stare at anything else. Sure. Do you see it permeating into anything you're doing yet? Or is it something you feel like it's going to take time to process and filter through into your creative activities? If it, yeah, if it comes out, it's going to come on its own from elsewhere. Um, here's a question. Someone has just started a lawnmower. Is this a problem? Cause I no, can... no, I can't hear it at all. Okay, good. I, I, I thought it was going to be a more deep question than that, frankly, but no, I'm, I'm glad it was just a long hour. I was like, Jesus, she's going to ask something where she's right. going to realize how shallow I am. It's going Listen, to be terrible. there's this lawnmower thing going on. <laughs> I, I think a lot of that stuff we don't have, uh, I don't know what artists might have direct control over their, you know, access to their subconscious and where the shit actually gets made. Um, I have none and I don't have a lot of interest in looking under the hood either. What I am seeing is the, the current moment reflected in the stuff that I'm either reading or watching or seeking out. That's where I'm seeing it. Um, like right now I'm hooked on Babylon Berlin. I can't watch it fast enough. And it's, if you don't know the show, it's amazing. It's on Netflix. I did the first episode. I oh. loved it. I just, I have to settle in to watch it and not be in that. I need to look at an iPad or whatever moment because oh, yeah. I know you have to, it, subtitles, you know, you want to read mm -hmm. the whole thing as it's, as it's happening. Um, so yeah, I have to, to make that sort of commitment in time, but it looks wonderful. I first saw it, I was on a flight and a person next to me was watching and I over their shoulders saw like two or three episodes over time. I'm like, that looks really good. It's <laughs> I, I, gorgeous. I, I mean, it's just gorgeous just as a production. They did a beautiful yeah. job. And, but as, as a moment in time when things are really on the cusp and could have gone many different ways, um, that moment in Germany's history feels very keen to, yeah. you know, where we are teetering on a particular brink and mm -hmm. watching that and watching people who have no, uh, you know, the characters in, in this narrative have no idea how things are going to turn out. Just like we don't have any idea how things are going to turn out. You never yeah. know how the story ends, you know, while you're in it. So looking at stuff like that or being drawn to reread books like Ridley Walker uh, Russell Holbin's great post-apocalyptic yeah. novel. And I've been pushing that on everybody and going, read this because it will change your life. And now's the time if you haven't read it. Um, where people, that's where people are deliberately grappling with things like now, like this kind of stew of chaos that we're in. And that I think is very comforting and helpful. Mm -hmm. I wonder about you and comfort. I think of velocities and I, I think it was a line you said, it's it's about how we approach the strange and the, the well, again, it, the very last week before we all went into lockdown, I recorded with uh, two translators who were curating the a big festival of German language uh, literature in the in New York. Uh, and the theme for this year was turn and face the strange. Mm. And at the time, it was first week of March. At the time, we were like, so do you have contingency plans yet if the Europeans aren't allowed to travel over here? Like, at no point on March 5th were we thinking, by the way, New York is going to be shut down and you won't be able to go anywhere or do anything. And, right. and what we thought the strange was versus what the strange turned out to be. It's not really a question. It's more me, me uh, meditating and meandering, but you know. No, I, I think, That's what I, do. I think chaos is its own engine, right? And things happen and we are very much in a reactive mode and maybe our culture in some ways, not uniquely, but our, our culture is used to being able to access or a certain segment of our culture is used to things happening and being able to get, you know, it's like a Yelpification mode, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't like yeah. that. I mean, I don't like this pandemic. It isn't what I wanted. And, you know, no one care. This, 
your wants and your needs are immaterial right now. And that's that in itself is very strange to us. We're used to being able to make things happen and now things are happening to us. I think the better working relationship you have with chaos is going forward from this moment on because, you know, climate crisis didn't go away and this is not the last pandemic we're going to see. And the better, the more nimble you are and the better working relationship you have with chaos uh, the easier life is going to become or the more manageable it will become. And the yeah, I think it'll be easier, but we'll handle it with more, more flexibility. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, in, in that sense, it will become easier, right? Because the second time someone tells you to put on a mask, it's not going to freak you out as much. You, yeah. you know, again, that's the lesson of the ICU. The first few times you're there, it's like, oh, this place is so crazy. And then you get used to that too. I mean, I remember sitting in a hospital cafeteria outside the cardiac ICU in the University of Chicago Hospital and seeing this pill just lying on the floor. And the family member I was with, we looked at it and said, should we take that? (laughs) Because we were so (laughs) weirded out at that point. We're like, what do you think would happen if we just, just took that pill? The, the, I'm sure there's an app now where basically you, you put it on camera and it'll tell you right. what it was, you know, but, <laughs> no. but still, yeah. Yeah. Can you uh, imagine a hospital cafeteria floor? Oh boy. But <laughs> yeah, it, it, the better, the better you realize that you're not in control and you never have been in control and you never will be in control. It's like trying to argue with a river, right? It, it's just, it's pointless. You're, you're not going to win. So if you learn to swim, in the river, you're better off or float better yet. Learn to float. Yeah, do you have any, um, only because a guest a few days ago brought up transcendental meditation, which I've never taken up. Uh, do you have any practice along those lines or in religion or anything that, that works for you? Or is this experiential based on, you know, years of, of having to deal with the low level chaos of our day to day lives? Yeah, I have no coping mechanisms. I don't have anything. <laughs> I just don't. I'm grateful right. that other people do. You're able to create and, and write stuff in the middle of all this. So that's, you know, I take that as, as coping in its, in its way. Um, no, you're right, actually. That is, that is my coping mechanism is I work. I work. This no is what I what. do. I mean, right. in addition to the day job stuff, I mean, every goddamn day I've been doing this. And it's one of those like, surely I should downshift and just do this once a week or two or three but what would i do in the off days and i would go nuts so right. i figure this is a uh, this is better than than insanity slightly but uh it is about- and it's oh. and it's creative too it's creative i mean you're having these conversations with all the people and they're all it's like a bunch of little tops all going around in the same way on a big giant tabletop and we're all like spinning in our own ways. But it must be kind of comforting to to look at that and go, look at all the tops. You know, we're all yeah. here on this tabletop doing this thing. There's that whole sense that, you know, and it's a cliche, we're all in this together, but nobody is telling me, oh yeah, Gil, things are just fine for me. I'm able to go anywhere and do anything. No one can do that. Right. You know, we're all... I had one with Christopher Brown uh, weeks ago, and he was going to go on a road trip from Austin up to Iowa, I think, to see his family. And at the time, I was just like, really? Because I'm in North Jersey. If I stop somewhere with New Jersey plates, they'll probably shoot at me anywhere else in the country (laughs) because we're the second most infected state there is. And uh, yeah, he was, oh, it should be fine. And then a few days later, it was, eh. My wife and I rethought things and decided to to stay home and not risk traveling up the and, country to, to go. And when you do have, you know, the luxury of being able to shelter in place and still be able to, you know, maintain your income and, and maintain your life, yeah. um, that's a giant luxury. And if you're not taking advantage of it, I can't imagine why. Yeah, that's a, a a gigantic privilege. On top of that, I don't have kids, so unlike oh, I know. your oh, massive God. concern of your your son, I at least yeah, my father's eighty two. I haven't seen he lives ten miles from here. Haven't seen him since the beginning of February, and it's mm. just one of those things. I'm like, I I can't. I might not know that I have it, and you're in shitty enough health that it'll kill you in like five minutes. So 
you know, we'll just text every day and make sure, you know, each one of us is doing all right. But yeah, it's just kind of weird. Uh, the one thing I did want to bring up as far as fiction that maybe kind of sort of gets at this, I didn't like the the last two William Gibson novels that much. Mm. I don't know if you've, you've read them, but um, from the future, when they look back at the jackpot, as it was known, where everything went wrong at the same time, it mm. took decades. The climate issue, pandemics, et cetera, everything happens you know, in retrospect, they're looking back at it over 60 or 70 years and it wipes out this massive chunk of the the, the population. Um, that, you know, I, I appreciated the way he rendered that. And I read the first one last February, just as all this was starting to go south. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that's um, trying to bring some some SF uh, angle into to the conversation. But the thing I wanted to, oh, go on. No, the, and that's why... I mean, you take your angles where you can find them, right? And that's why something like Babylon Berlin is so helpful because you're seeing it, but you're seeing it in a mirror. You're not saying, because I don't know how much a good friend of mine, a writer said, I do not want to read anybody's. She was invited to a, a Zoom event of pandemic poetry and she's like i will be fucked if i will go to this she's like i do not want to hear anybody's pandemic poetry right now i don't care who it is i don't care if it's my friends i'm not doing it because i can't take that direct one-on-one -on -one. um yeah. i don't i don't want to apprehend it that way and she does have a little kid too so there's that whole entire issue but hmm. even even the uncertainty in the very beginning of saying, well, how is the supply chain going to hold out? You know, how are we actually going to be able to, I was talking to another friend who lives in Chicago and she said, yeah, the first time we went grocery shopping, you know, it was kind of strange. And then by the next time we went back, we were like in Russia and we were just all in line and we just yeah. all, she travels there a lot. And she's like, it felt totally familiar to me because it's like, oh, you have to queue up to, oh, all right. Oh, okay. I get this. <laughs> And just acclimated, you know, like that. But even even those moments of wondering, well, I mean, I am not proud, but I hoarded cat food. I did because yeah. it's like I, if we die, uh, you for, know, for your cat, right? Not for yourself, uh, right. right? No, absolutely for okay, my just cat. Just making sure first. But yes, when, when it's for the cat, then, then it all makes sense. Yeah, because if it was for you, that'd be a little weird. But it would be a little yeah, strange. The cat's not going to be able to go off and. and well, that, and I know. Well, that's the thing. It's like, but that's like that's my anxiety point. It's like, can I make sure you know that my cat is fed and taken care of? And like, okay, he's fine. I've got you know curbside pickup set up. I'm good. And then it wasn't, but everyone has that worry point and the people who are having to work and homeschool their kids and, or if their children have any kind of a disability or, you know, a learning issue or whatever, mm -hmm. it's exponentially worse. And everyone's had to kind of learn this on the fly. Yeah. And that was, and it'll sound weird, but I did one of these with Ellen Datlow pretty early in, in the process, like uh, early April, I think. And I was expecting you know, some meta thinking about, you know, what pandemics mean, effect on fiction and all that. And she just wanted to talk about like disinfecting the cat food before bringing it in right. and her best practices for all this stuff. And I thought that matters more right now than all of my, you know, uh, galaxy brain thinking about this stuff. It's how is she going to take care of the cats and yeah, edit some books and, you know, figure out the next project, et cetera. But making sure she can get the cat food in without getting sick is, you know, priority number one. And trying to figure out how are you, and the, the information has changed, you know, as, as we go on, yeah. obviously it's all new and saying, well, okay, we need to super disinfect. Okay. Maybe we don't need to go that far. Okay. That's good. That's okay. It's, yeah. it's this, it's that. But even when you're being incredibly careful, a friend had posted early this morning and just having a panic attack and said, I went out and he lives in New York and he said, I went out and I touched stuff without gloves. And then without thinking, I ate like a Tic Tac. Oh shit. You know, did yeah. I just infect myself? Did I, people are like, you know, calm down, don't panic. You know, yeah, it's probably not the best thing you could have done, but you know, don't yeah. flip out. The amount of exposure is minuscule, et cetera. <sighs> but yeah. But I wore anxiety. gloves on the subway forever. I, I when I ride the New York subway, it could be the middle of summer, and I will have on my my leather gloves. I've always worn a pair of gloves on the subway just because 
it's a New York subway. Is, <laughs> no, if you shine an ultraviolet light in there, you'd, you'd know. Oh, you'll see. Yeah. Insane. No. I, the last time I went through LaGuardia, I wore shoes without socks. God help me. And they took my shoes. And then I was sitting there like for a half an hour with bare feet in LaGuardia. Oh. I'm like, do I have to just <laughs> cut my feet off? Now? <laughs> Should I just cut them <laughs> off before I go home and just throw them in some bins? Dip them somewhere? in acid. And, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. It was so nasty. I couldn't believe it was happening. And then they gave me all my stuff back and sent me on my way. I'm like, did this mean anything? No, you can go. Okay, fine. <laughs> I don't even want to put my shoes on. Now. It's like the damage is done. <laughs> Security theater. but ew, that's, that's Oh, my horrible. God. No. And so much of anxiety is because of simple things like that. Like you don't know. Is it, should I, you know, blast my groceries before I bring them in? Am I going to have enough? Am I going to be able to get things that I need? Am I, and some of it is because we are, a lot of us are incredibly privileged people and have not had to grapple with things that would cause, you know, kind of a grim smile in other places. See, it's weird for me because in in New Jersey, area we had in the beginning of the last decade, we had those two, there was a super storm and the, the hurricane. Right. And we had a full week with no power. Uh, one was getting on late fall. The other was middle of summer. And things turned to Mad Max in about five seconds because <laughs> gasoline was the number one thing. Everybody right. had to get gas for their generators. And it literally was our neighbors saying, we heard there's gas up on the New York Thruway and we've got to get up there and see if we can get some. I'm like, wow. Like I filled up my tank right before this hit. I'm not going anywhere. And we've got a wood burning stove downstairs. Fuck it. I don't need TV. I don't need like our right. local library had a generator going to recharge devices. That was it. I just read all of the uh, the Deptford trilogy by Robertson Davies. There you over go. Over the course of a week. Nothing There's else a- to do. Well, let's tackle 800 pages of Gothic <laughs> Canadian literature. You know? Well, and and some of it is the idea that what do I actually need? I mean, clearly mm-hmm. I needed cat food to be able to feel like I was in control of something, like I could feed my animal. He wasn't going to you yeah. know, drop dead. But what beyond that, what do you need and what can you take away from this? You know, because there, I was yeah, talking- what are you learning like that? What have, what have you seen that you can, what, what seems superfluous now to you? Everything but human contact. Yeah. That's the thing that's killing me. Yeah. Even, a, even not even physical contact, just, I've said this before on, on this run, just sitting across a table from someone. Right. My and, coffee and meetings. Oh God, I miss my coffee meetings. Um, I work with a, a movement artist and I had to drop some stuff off at her place And just to be able to see each other in the real world was so exciting. You know, I stood at the bottom on the sidewalk and she stood on her porch and we were like, hi, how are you? It was just so, I mean, we've talked, you know, on FaceTime, whatever, but it's not the same. It's not the same. And that. I guess it ties to the big question though, for you, immersive theater is, is your thing, uh, your, your, your form. How do you see that? In future, like, have you been thinking about what it means, what that form is going to exist like? Oh, absolutely. That Those are some of the meetings I had to cancel. I was um, booked to go to Chicago and talk to a theater there about doing a production of the project I'm working on now called Dark Factory. And that mm-hmm. got blown out of the water. And in a way... It, <sighs> I think it's kind of fortuitous because it's forcing me to reimagine how can this work in, how can a narrative work without trying to mimic, because that's what's so disgusting about Zoom and things like that. It's trying to mimic something that it can't Mm -hmm. mimic, really. It's not real connection. It's it's the best we can do now and thank God we have it, but it's still not, it doesn't offer the same thing. So stop trying to make it. It's, it's the reason that when I stopped drinking like 10,000 years ago, I never drank like no alcohol, wine, or it's like, I don't do that anymore. So I'm not going to try to mimic, you know, the, I'm having a glass of nothing. You know, I mean, that's just not on my radar anymore. I don't do that anymore. So how, can an immersive narrative be offered to people? How can they be invited to to be part of it? Because in this moment, we're not all going to be in a space, period. 
but what does that give us? How can that expand the experience then? And how can you create it to be able to offer it to as many people as possible, which means, you know, virtually, but how can they still take it in, in a way that feels just that immersive, that it's made just for them? Because the most successful immersive events that I've produced and directed have had, all of them have had these moments where the participants took it and ran with it. And I could never have seen that coming in a million years. And it was unbelievably exciting to watch. There was one moment in particular that stands out. Um, I had done a version of Alice in Wonderland. And in my reimagining, it took place in a, a parochial school, like a um, preschool, like with the tiny little chairs and, and that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And people were allowed to go from room to room and different things were happening. And all this, you know, merry chaos was going on. And some of it was not so merry because the Red Queen was like incredibly murderous. Okay. She's a gal that I just went to visit on her porch. I'm like, I love you. I love you. But she was full of murder in this production. And one of the other characters was uh, Tweedledee. We had decided that Tweedledum was dead and Tweedledee had gone hopelessly psychotic and was holed up in this little room with like colored lights and Laffy Taffy and nail polish. And she kept inviting people in to play with her because she wouldn't leave her room because she was agoraphobic and so all through the evenings, you know, patrons would come in and hang out with her. And she was this beautiful, friendly, inoffensive, kind of sad, little broken, adorable creature. And the Red Queen straight up killed her and choked her out and left her body on a sofa in the hallway of the school. And people were aghast at this. And... I actually lost a friend over this production. He's like, I don't even know you. If you could let that happen, I don't even know you. <laughs> oh, but having her, she the, the performer had wanted to be killed and thrown on the floor. And I said, you can't be on the floor. You're going to be crushed. Someone's going to step on you. It's half dark. That's not safe. You have to be killed on the couch. So she was left on the couch dead. And as people walked past her, they behaved exactly as they would at a wake. They touched her. They paused at the couch. It was the most extraordinary thing I had ever seen. They, that death was completely real and they acted accordingly. And we all just looked at, I mean, the hair just stands up on the back of your neck. How, now how to get an experience like that into a format that people can experience it virtually is going to be the task. And had thoughts yet that seem practicable or feasible, or is it still just marinating? As you well, try to, and don't give away anything if it turns no, out to be something. No, no, and it's yeah. it's 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 growing. It's yeah. What's a what's a good word for metastasizing? That's a bad <laughs> word. <laughs> proliferating it's from, pro uh, the, it, it is yeah. it's expanding because it is it's also a novel i mean it, it there's a novel yeah. but there's also a lot of components unfolding to the Un novel. unfolding is good yes unfold unfolding and 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 it is growing i mean it continues to yeah. expand and form so i'm really excited to see what we can do i'm talking to some people who work in vr i'm talking to musicians like how the can vr we... thing was the first thing i was thinking that yeah, but it's not advanced enough but that's the the way you can get people to feel as though they're not just looking at a little tiny screen with the rest of their room wherever they are around them but yeah Jeez. And and it's some of it is, it is, and that's what's really exciting is to say, well, how can I offer? And I have gone through this with everything that I've ever you know made or adapted or whatever. It's like, what is the way to tell this? What's the core of this story? Like when I, I did a version of Dracula, and the idea was, the tagline was, appetite must be fed, and the whole idea is that, hmm. hey, human, you're not the top of the food chain anymore. How are you going to deal with that? How is this going to work for you? You're coming to have dinner with Dracula. You know, how does it feel to know that you may or may not survive it? And so it's finding the core of this and saying how to offer that core. What's the best format? And, and then I'll know. 
Now, who knows when they I will be? A, I hope I it's a, in the I next have a, few a months. Weird, weird, yeah, I've got this weird vision of something right now. I'll share with you <laughs> off mic, but yeah, just, just okay. a, a strange way of staging something. But it would still involve people being in a place, but half of them would be uh, wearing significant protective gear that uh, would have to be incorporated into whatever the hell you were telling. Um, yeah, because that's that's just me and my. In yeah. fact, it was the question I ha I had for Richard Cadry when I read The Grand Dark. His his mm. most recent novel was whether he had read your Under the Poppy trilogy or not, and he said he hadn't because there were aspects of it that that you know uh, echoed it, um, or at least seemed to to that the two of you had the same fountain of of inspiration for it. So. Um, and we're all kind of, I mean, depending on who the writer is, but a lot of times you find out you're working the same side of the street as someone yeah. and you've had no idea until someone says to you, hey, did you look at, you know, such and such? Wow, it reminded me of your ex. And yeah. there's a, a really bad movie um, with a hole in it. And I cannot tell you how many people have said to me, Kathy, have you seen that? It's like they're ripping off the cipher. And I'm like, dude, I did not make up that hole either. <laughs> I don't know the film. I will never see it, but yeah. that's kind of, you know, the pardon the pun, but that's a bottomless idea too. It's like, here is this strange hole that's in the middle of this sort of squalid place and there's no explanation for it. And it's just there. And what are you going to do about it? And, and I'm really happy that that book is coming back to print in English this, this fall. That is a book. Oh yeah. That, I was going to mention that. I had that on my, my notes. Yes. For years and years, people have said, oh, when will the cipher come back to print in English? And now I'm so glad that I can say in September. Yeah. What language was it in that it was, you know, that, that you have to qualify it with in English? Most recently Spanish. It's been oh. in, it's been translated in many, many languages and Italian mm -hmm. and French and German and Japanese and Polish, and it's been widely translated, and I'm very happy with that. But it had not had an English language edition, and it was the whole thing was a just a joy to put together. And it was yeah. fun working on the cover because it's a very iconic cover. People who you know bought the original book are really into the Marshall Erisman cover, and so it was a lot of fun to try to work with that in mind, but to make it completely new. And this edition also has an afterword uh, by the completely brilliant Maurice Meyer, who, if you don't know her work, you have to get out there immediately and read her because... At least two people have mentioned her to me in recent months. I think it was Henry Wessels and probably Richard, uh, Richard Cadre also. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I will look her up now. Fine. Oh, okay. she's the I'm bee's sorry. knees. She really is. I mean, she's got a voice like nobody else. She has a, in fact, she has a, a novel coming out from FSG Originals this September, we were both, we were going to try to do something together, but you know, probably we can't, but we will no. again one day, but it's called the seventh mansion and it's crazy pants. I wouldn't gild that Lily by even describing it. You should just read it. I will look it up. Now, let me ask, because we started this with velocities, which we should be talking about, but, um, reissuing cipher and going back and looking at, at an early book of yours. And the parallels with collecting a bunch of your previously published fiction for Velocities, as well as a couple of unpublished works. Is there a any sort of vibe in terms of looking back at old old projects and, you know, I really should have tweaked this or I could change that? Or, you know, is everything a I'm happy with how Cypher has been received over the, the years and this new collection is, you know, something that stands on its own, even though you look at that in retrospect too. the retrospect of the fact that the stuff's already been published. I mean, yeah, no, I never, I, and I couldn't anyway, even if I want to, I'm not a rewriter. I yeah. couldn't go back. And I don't think just for me, just for my own work to try to go back and remake something wouldn't work. It, yeah. that, those were the, the tools that I had. That was the idea I had. That was the moment. And that thing was created. And that's what it is. I can't, you know, it's not a recipe. I can't go back and remake it. it that's it for better or worse. And I'm sure there are things I would do differently. And, you know, that book was written, um, Christ 30 years ago. So yeah. I'm a more economical writer now than I was then. 
but it would not be the same book. It just would not be the same book. Yeah, how have you changed as a writer? I'm better. Let me say more economical. Yeah. I'm better at it. I've, I've gotten <laughs> better at it. I know after all these years, you would hope that I was better. Um, yeah, uh, I think the the preoccupations are the same. I don't know that we have a lot of control over that. I think you get what you get. And, you know, those are the, I think Flannery O'Connor said, you know, there's a, there's a limit to what you can make come alive. I'm paraphrasing. She would say it mm -hmm. more economically still, but you have your own, you know, little bag of obsessions and things that make you go, whoa, and things that you can't touch. And all of those things make you, they, they bring you to the place where you can work and they're your tools and they're your, you know, your what, your palette that you can work with. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I have learned the value of economy more and more and more. And I still, to this day, will go through things. And a, another great writer who I admire a lot, Carter Scholes. Um, oh God. Yeah. Oh, I, I what think, was that? Uh, the nuclear testing novel. Yeah. Radiance. Yeah. Radiance. Yeah. Oh my <sighs> God. He's so, so good. And actually he was the one who taught me to read stuff out loud when you're done. I hadn't done that. I'd never done it. And then once he showed me how to do that, I started doing it for everything. And it blew my mind that you can be reading something from a screen or a page and your mouth will say it correctly, whether or not, you know what I mean? Your mouth will correct for what's on the page. If it's, huh. if it's not, if the rhythm is wrong, if it's not mellifluous sure. enough, your mouth will do it. So I, I've learned to do that. I've, I've learned to cut out as much as I possibly can. And that only the things that are absolutely necessary should be there. That's why I think haiku is probably the highest form of writing a, a superior haiku. You really can't do any better than that. And that's why the zine that I will someday publish is going to be called Haiku for Business Travelers. <laughs> that's the, uh, oh <laughs> the I want to subscribe. Series. Trust me, I've written dozens of these things, usually on the road. I just, you know, I was sitting in a plane and I will start composing. And I needed a title for, there's a whole zine idea I've had for, for years that I just have to sit down and actually make as opposed to telling guests about. Um, and I had this really dramatic title for it. And then I realized haiku for business travelers is so much more evocative. And, and so that's the catch all title, which will include some of the haiku as well as essays, uh, transcripts of the podcast and other stuff. But yeah. Anyway, no, that would be brilliant. I, I will send you, I, I will, I, in fact, let me, I, let me see. I might have one here. The one advantage of doing this stuff, um, uh, uh, remotely is that I'm, I'm sitting at my computer so I can actually look for things on the fly really, really quickly. Um, no, these were all at the Newark train station, which isn't the same, but um, oh, that's a nice one. This open book life, a palimpsest written in invisible ink. I kind of mm. like that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's and a that, feeling of transience. After the plane crash. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a man. I got a whole ton of these. I got to go back. There's one about losing all of your chargers. Oh, well, anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Talk about powerless, right? That's it. There's all these things that occur to you when you're sitting in airports and waiting in transit and all that, that as a person whose day-to-day -day life is governed by business, um, you know, it's one thing, most of these sessions that I do with, with guests, they tell me, well, as a cartoonist or as a writer, this hasn't changed my life very much because I'm an antisocial shut-in. So <laughs> <laughs> when you realize that there is that level of, of interaction or, or travel that you had to engage in, you, you, you try to find those moments of art within those too, I guess. And that's the, that's, that's the kernel really of what dark factory is about is that because I just as a my sidebar, last question, what is it? What yeah, it well, the, I, I subscribe to the Patreon. I just want you to explain what it is, at least in generality. It's, it's a narrative experience and that sounds so highfalutin, but it's not, I can't just call it a book. I can't just call it a video. I can't, it is, it's a narrative experience that when I, I called the book Dark Factory before I knew that Dark Factory was also a term for a robot workplace. 
like a robot factory because you don't need lights. They're robots. Right. It's a dark factory. And that seemed to me that that was like one of those internal moments of, ah, you know, when the choir starts up. Hmm. Because this whole narrative is about how do we open up to the world? How do we really see what's happening? How do we open up to the world around us? How do we understand how strange life really is? And the I had, had told the story on the, the Patreon. Um, the I was walking down the street, and I preface this story by saying this is a thing that happened to me. People can believe it or not, but this is something that happened to me. I was walking down the street in my neighborhood about four blocks from my house, and I was in a horrible mood. And it was in one of those moods where you're like, Fuck it. Nobody cares what I do. And I'm just working myself to death and nobody even cares. I have no idea what you're talking about. Right. You know, you're just walking along (laughs) going nothing and I don't even care. And I don't even know why I'm doing this. And nobody, nobody even says, thank you. Nobody even says, thank you. And there was a little piece of paper on the ground and I picked up the paper and the paper said, thank you very much. And that's the true story. And it scared the shit out of me. (laughs) He dropped (laughs) the paper because I was so startled and yet I was not startled. It's like, okay, all right, you, I, I have been heard. That is a direct confirmation. And it, and it's also so dry and so completely the opposite of, you know, I wanted a bouquet and possibly some, you know, (laughs) champagne or like, and it's like, here's a dirty little piece of paper on the ground. Okay. I hear you now get back to work. Go. (laughs) And it was perfect. It was perfect. And that's, that is what dark factory is about is the, the communication that is happening all the time between us and life. And what does that mean? What does it mean to live a life open to that kind of communication? And what would you do? How would your life change if you did? And there's like dancing and sex in it too. So <laughs> it's, oh, not, <laughs> it's not all <laughs> metaphysics, but yeah. But that, how, how yeah. would it be if you were really aware? I mean, people talk about coming to a state of awareness or coming to a state of gratitude or, and i believe that there's also a fair amount of terror in that mix as well. I mean, talk about being out of control. If you really stop to think about why is there a little piece of paper on the ground that says, thank you very much that I walk by and I feel moved to pick it up. That's really spooky. If you think about it and what else is out there, if that is true and it is true, what else is out there that I haven't seen yet? And what's it going to say to me? So it's trying to get that experience into a format that people can react to it in an intimate way that I'm, I'm excited about and also, you know, terrified about. And yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to, you know, how to help <laughs> how to, yeah. you know anything i could do to, to, to you know even make it happen but also conceptualize what it all could could transform into because this is a sort of art that i would love to see happen and i feel like it is it, it's not like a super like outre very like conceptual because normally i can't stand conceptual art i can't stand anything that makes me want to If it can't speak to me without me reading the white card on the wall, I'm not interested. Okay. I'm just not interested. You're not engaging me correctly. I don't think as a, as an art participant. So trying to make that happen for people in a way that's fun, that's super intuitive, that, you know, you don't have to spend a lot of time. That's what I don't like about VR and about any, uh, I mean, the, the technology is moving faster and faster. But, and I say this as someone who can't use VR because I have horrible motion sickness. I get motion sickness in a rocking chair. I mean, I'm just pointless for this technology, (laughs) but like any technology, I mean, remember back in the day when phones were like shoeboxes, you know, I mean, the technology will change. It's the, it's the way that we use it and interface with it. I just read this right before we started. I read this great Google doc that 
and I don't even know who this woman is. Somebody had tweeted it and I read it and it blew my mind. She's talking about, she's calling it commie OS and saying, what if our devices and our, our little machines and whatever are actually like little gods. They're like little kami, you know, the Japanese spirits and mm -hmm. we'll have that kind of relationship with them. Not that it's like things that do things for us or, or like a capital G God, but like, like a bunch of little helpful spirits yeah, that are household, are, gods. Yeah. household gods. Exactly. And yeah. I thought, wow, that's fantastic. Yes. Yeah, that's what we need. In a really prosaic and mundane way, uh, there's a new Jerry Seinfeld's uh, uh, stand-up performance on Netflix. And I, I have not seen Seinfeld, that. Yes. Where he does the, uh, how basically we're just here to, to take the phone to the next charger. <laughs> you know, we're, we're just serving the phone and, and, you know, it's not helping us. We're really helping them. Um, but yeah, that's, that's because we're, we're, you know. Of a certain age, I guess, you know, that's the sort of humor that I've, I've fallen in with. And at this point, I realize, yeah, it's, that's kind of my alley. But, but yeah, there's that degree of, of what these devices have come to mean to us, too. That's, uh, well, again, that's a whole other story for us to get into down, down the line. No, for um, sure. But, and, and that we have dependencies that we never thought we would. Yeah. And it's and like, addictions. Addictions oh, yeah. always find a way to, to eat up human beings as, we're well aware. Oh, absolutely. Um, last question, though. I know it's just the human contact vibe that's really killing you, but one place you really want to go that you can't go right now? There's this coffee place that I like to go to called Olaman. And yeah. it feels very, it has, it's in a suburb of, well, an enclosed suburb of Detroit. It's a little city that exists within Detroit called Hamtramck. It's uh it's actually the place of my ancestors. It's where all my Polish I never relatives knew how that was came pronounced. from. I'd always yes. seen it before. Yes, it's in okay. it's in Hamtramck and it's it's super cool. It has a very a very continental vibe and it's very friendly and welcoming and the coffee's really good and I will run into people that I know there and I have lots of meetings there and I really miss that place. I would love to go in there and just sit at they have a little garden space out back, a little patio, and just sit there and have a coffee and have people sitting there talking around me and having their own meetings and doing whatever they're doing and to just exist. I do. I miss that a lot. And and that's where we go back to the idea of doing you can't overlay one experience with another and expect it to feel the same. Going there in PPE is I don't know how yeah. that's gonna work, right? The the vibe is totally will be totally different. There will have to be another way to get that same feeling of accidental community. And I don't know how that's going to work. Where would you go? What do you miss? Uh, there's, I've been thinking about it for the last couple of days because I usually ask guests this and I've, my stock response is just sitting across a table from somebody recording a conversation, which, you know, that's my compulsion, but as far as a location goes, probably the the bookstore down in Montclair, New Jersey. Even though I I never go in, I, I it's a closest used bookstore, indie bookstore around about thirty miles away. Um, just meandering among books besides the two thousand or so books that are surrounding me here in the library in my house, you know, just just having something like that, I think, would be my uh, my moment of okay. I'm I'm back somewhere that I belong. It's either that or this great Mexican joint uh, right over the state line in New York State. But I think going to a nice bookstore or a, a rundown bookstore and just just breathing in the uh, the titles that somebody else sold back a million years ago. And the, and the, it's that same feeling of serendipity too that you don't know what you're going to find. You don't. Yeah. You're your own algorithm, right? You're you're stumbling over things or things are, you know, falling into your lap, maybe literally that you say, Oh, wow, this is, wow, this is for me. So that's oh, yeah. how that's you always been my, what, what the, for all the good stuff for Amazon in terms of convenience, et cetera, and the rest of the internet, it, it kills serendipity. That's yeah. that, that accidental discovery is, is what I, what I long for, I guess. Although I just found anyway. the Kami OS and that was completely serendipitous. So, and that was from Twitter, God help us. So there you go. Yeah. I guess there's, there's those opportunities, but again, it's like you were saying, and what I've said about doing these remotely instead of in person, it's an approximation. Yeah. 
you know, like you and I, we've spoken at least, so we understand each other's rhythm somewhat, but this is still much more about the information than it is about that hotel room in Saratoga where you were staying. Right. And, you know, shooting the breeze, you know, sitting at that, that table and having a conversation. This is, again, it's not as bad as little video tiles where everybody's you know, <laughs> got funny backgrounds up, but, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, that whole simulation of, of conversation, which again, it's as good as we can get for now, but it yeah. is virtual reality, we'll isn't it? I mean, it's certainly real. Yeah. It's reality. It's happening. We're having a conversation. But yeah, it's not. On the other hand, we wouldn't be having this conversation now because I'm in Detroit and you're in New Jersey. And so this would not be yeah. happening otherwise. So so I there's have, that, that's I one guess. Of those things. You know, it, and I've, I've talked about this too, the idea that once we're able to do in person again, I'll probably keep doing these also you know, do, do them alongside the in-person ones because for people like you who I would just never get an opportunity except every five to eight years right. to, to meet up with in person, you know, we take what we can get. Absolutely. And you make it, I mean, that's the way we're going to have to do a lot of readjusting and the, the days ahead, everything is going to have to be recalibrated. And there, I, I'm enough of an optimist to believe that things will come out of it that will be beneficial and that will say, well, we wouldn't, we would never, you know, weigh that calculus and say it was worth it. It will never be worth it to all the dead and the families of the dead. But if something good comes out of it, then it's still something good and we'll take it. The survivors will take it, but no, it will never, it will never be enough. It will never be enough to make up for, and especially all the people who died needlessly so many who died that never, this never had to happen. I'm hip. Anyway, Kath, thanks so much for coming back on. And someday I, you know, I make no predictions whatsoever, despite my pharmaceutical industry background, <laughs> no predictions at all for when we're going to be able to, to meet in person again. But, you know, I sincerely hope we can, uh, we could sit at a table. Next time in New York, next time in the city. Sounds awesome. That'd be good. Thanks so much, Kath. All right. Thank you. And that was Kathy Koja. Go get her brand new collection, Velocities, from Meerkat Press. It's available through Better Bookstores uh, and the bookshop.org website, which shares revenue with indie bookstores. Uh, you should also check out Kathy's past work, like The Cipher and her Under the Poppy trilogy. Uh, Kathy's website is kathykoja.com, which has links to her books, her immersive productions, her Patreon, and more. Uh, that's k-a-t-h-e-k-o-j-a dot com. There's also plenty of links to pieces uh, about Velocities from her virtual book tour if you'd like to learn more about the collection there. Now, she's on Twitter as Kathy Koja and on Facebook as Kathy dot Koja. It's all spelled the same way, K-A-T-H-E. Uh, I'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes for this one. Oh, and you should definitely go to the Patreon that she's doing for her, well, for her new one, Dark Factory. And that is Patreon dot com slash Kathy Koja. All one word. Now, in the before time, uh, I always recorded these episodes in person, but nowadays I'm using Zencaster.com to record remotely. If you're interested in learning more about that, you can uh, visit the site at Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R.com. So Zencaster without a final E. There's a free hobby level as well as a pro level that's 20 bucks a month. Uh, I use the pro level because I get a higher quality audio file at the end. Um my Patreon supporters more than cover the 20 bucks a month and another 20 for the Libsyn hosting service I use for the podcast. Um, my expenses have dropped, frankly, because I'm not driving into New York or, or up to Saratoga, um, not spending money on parking and tolls and subway trips and coffee, et cetera, for all the in-person stuff. Um, I am going to put out a chunk of money to publish the first issue of Haiku for Business Travelers, but that's on me. So if you can spare anything, uh, don't give it to me. Go find the Patreons, like Kathy's, uh, GoFundMes, Indiegogos, Kickstarters, Tip Jars, whatever, for the artists and writers you like, and show them some support. 
If you're not comfortable giving to individuals directly, then give to charities, uh, your local food bank, and other places that will help people in need. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.